Hello and welcome to Architecture 135. This is Digital Tools for Designers and this is the online virtual version of this class. So a little bit about me. Um, that's always the most important question is who am I and why am I here staring at the computer looking, looking at you uh, trying to teach you a few things. My name is Grant Adams. I'm an Associate Professor of Architecture uh, at Diablo Valley College. I have been for shocking 13 years. Uh, I was actually originally hired to teach this particular class uh, 13 years ago right after my master's degree and here I am still teaching it though this is a slightly different version uh, than I'm used to teaching. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, first off if you need to email me my email address is gadams at dvc.edu um, or you can also email me at grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com um, either one will get to the same place. So either email you uh, send to will get to me. Chances are if I reply to you, it'll come from the digitaltoolsforarchitects.com uh, email address. I also give you my phone number. It's there um, should you need to call me or text me, though I certainly reserve the right not to answer uh, if it's 3 in the morning or, or something like that. But for the most part, I try to be responsive uh, if I can and try to get you unstuck on those times when you really need that little bit of extra help um, even though it's not during a normal lab or office hour. Speaking of office hours, my office hours this semester are on Mondays from 7.30 to 9 in the morning and on Wednesdays from 2 to 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, those will all be by appointment. Um, if you need a time window outside of that, uh, email me and we can set something up in a, in a different time um, that's more convenient for you. And of course, because this is the virtual version, this will be, all be conducted uh, via Zoom. So uh, we'll set up a Zoom time where we can talk. A little bit more about me. Uh, like I said, I'm an associate professor of architecture here at, at DVC. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in architecture from UC Berkeley. I graduated in 2004 with that undergraduate degree. Uh, and for those of you that are in uh, architecture track, trying to figure out what your degrees are and, and which college to go to and that sort of thing, uh, the Berkeley program is a four-year degree program. It's an unaccredited architecture degree, so that means it's a Bachelor of Arts in architecture as opposed to a five-year program that has a Bachelor uh, of Architecture degree. I also followed that up with my uh, MARC, my Master of Architecture degree. I also went to UC Berkeley for that. Um, and because I had done a four-year unaccredited degree in architecture, that coupled with two years to get my master's degree. So in the, uh, in the lingo of architecture schools, that was a four plus two plan um, as opposed to the five plus one plan that you would be on with a master's degree uh, with an uh, um, undergraduate degree in architecture itself. Um, what do I do for my other job? Um, obviously I'm here two days a week teaching you guys, uh, but the rest of the time I actually kind of found my own way, which is a whole side topic uh, and, and worth exploring at some point, but certainly not in the first introductory lecture. Um, but I, uh, I have a general contractor's license. I ended up getting that after school. Um, and I, uh, I work and do property management primarily. So I have another career outside of this teaching. Um, this is just the fun part um, that I get to do with you guys. So this course does not use the Canvas program that most of uh, the classes at DVC do use. I have my own website that I run for this class. Uh, it's specific for this class, not for any, any of the other classes that you might be taking, although it does double up with my 136 class, which is the uh, Rhino and V-Ray class. Um, but it is digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. Uh, I also own the domain digitaltoolsfordesigners.com, so if you'd rather type that in, it, it doesn't really matter. It'll get to, you, to the digitaltoolsforarchitects.com website. Uh, and you're going to be using this website on an everyday basis in, during your coursework um, in 135. You'll use it to view your exercises and assignments. You'll certainly view your important course information like the syllabus will be posted there, etc. in addition to the copy that I emailed you already. Um, you'll use it to view the course calendar. Um, I'll post the course calendar that will give you some general guidelines uh, of what's going on there. Uh, and the big one is that you're going to be um, right here posting your exercises and assignments uh, each week as they're due. And so that's an important one for you guys to get used to. And uh, today's lab portion, I'm going to uh, have you guys walk through that and so you feel comfortable working uh, and posting stuff. It's pretty easy. Most people get it after the first couple 
times working on it. Uh, the other big thing that I have is I have a bunch of tutorials, videos, and uh, previous course lectures. And I think that'll be a really useful thing for you guys um, to come back and, and kind of refresh what you need or, or whatever I taught. It'll be posted there. You can go back and look. I have write-ups for how things work. I have video demonstrations. I have old lectures. So there's just lots of content on there uh, for you to use. And the last thing is to comment on other students' work. We'll talk about that a little bit more in this uh, presentation so that you guys get used to um, that, that whole commenting process. It's part of creating a nice interactive class. This is the Digital Tools for Architects website. I'll be walking through it a little bit later on in, in the lecture today so that you guys get comfortable with what exactly is, is going on um, and, and where everything is hidden, etc. The class schedule. You can view the course calendar on the website. Um, that's going to be your general guide for what are the topics being discussed, uh, when are the assignments and exercises due, etc. I think the big important thing here is that this is different from our standard class where we have a set schedule, we meet for lecture, then we meet for lab. Instead, this is set up as an a, a, what's called an asynchronous course. And the asynchronous course essentially means that you get to do the work on your schedule on your time. Uh, and that's really important. Um, given the current situation and, and the world at large, um, you need to be able to adjust your general schedule for, for what time you're going to uh, do the class itself. You're going to be responsible for watching the recorded lectures, at least two of them during the week that they're assigned. You'll also be required to complete the lab exercises, uh, and that'll be twice each week. If I'm being honest, the ideal way to do this is to set it up on a Monday and Wednesday schedule. Uh, you'll watch the lecture prior to the lab, the open lab hours. I'll talk about what those are in just a second. Um, and as long as you're matching up the numbers, if you watch, say, lecture 101, and then you do uh, your lab exercise 101 on that same day, that's going to work really convenient. Um, and if you have trouble on that particular um, lecture, or you didn't understand everything fully, it's a real good time to be able to go in and ask questions in the following lab uh, where you can get some one-on-one -on -one contact with me and, and kind of sort things out. Really, my goal is to get you guys the most time with me as possible. So let's talk a little bit more about that class schedule. You, you heard me talk about open labs. I've set this up a little bit different, and I hope um, that this will really be beneficial to you guys in your schedules so that you can all get access to me depending on what, what you're doing outside, what your job schedule is, etc. So let's start first with our Monday example. So we're here in Monday uh, and what we're going to be working on is there are two what are called open lab periods that I'll have offered for you on Monday. Um, the first open lab period will be from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. You can see that right there. And during that lab period on Monday, priority is going to be given to you guys. Those of you that are in 135, you're going to be the ones that take priority over my other classes. Um, the Archie 136 students, my other course, they can log in during that open lab and they can ask me questions, but I'm going to um, only ask or answer their questions when you guys uh, are done asking your questions or you don't have any questions and are just working. Uh, so that gives them the ability to adjust their schedule a little bit and ask a few questions if necessary. That being said, there's a second time slot available on Monday, and that's from 12 noon uh, through 2 p.m. And for that time slot, the priority is going to be given to the Archie 136, my Rhino and V-Ray students, and I'm going to let them have their opportunity uh, to ask questions first. And if they're not, if they're busy working and they don't have any questions, you guys can log in and you can ask your questions as well. So it gives you both uh, kind of a good set of windows where you can come in and, and get some contact time. Uh, the other thing to point out is that additional help is, of course, available by appointment during my office hours. On Monday, those are in the morning from 7.30 to 9 a.m., and that'll be for both Architecture 135 and for Architecture 136. So anybody can ask me questions during those, those office hour periods. So let's move on. And now we're going to look at the Wednesday schedule. So here we are on Wednesday. Um, same lab setup. So we have Lab 1 at 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. But who gets priority has been flip-flopped. So 136 gets priority in the morning session from 9 to 11. But of course, you as 135 students can log in and ask questions when they don't have questions or, or when they're busy working. Uh, and likewise, you'll have the priority in the afternoon time slot on Wednesday from 12 noon to 2 p.m. 
So that'll be your time slot. And the idea here is that we're spreading it around so that everybody, depending on your schedule, can have access and make sure that they can get help during these lab sections. So all of these will have Zoom uh, meeting links available. I'll email those out to you with the passwords. They're not going to be in this particular lecture. Uh, those will come out separately. Uh, and so you'll be able to log in and do it. The other thing is that my additional office hours uh, on Wednesdays are going to be after class, after that second lab session, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. That's on Wednesday. And again, whether you're in 135 or in 136, you can come and talk to me during that section. Just send me an email if you want uh, an appointment time slot. We'll do 15-minute windows uh, so that you can get that individualized help as necessary. So let's talk a little bit about the course software that we're going to be talking and really learning in this class. Um, so we're going to cover the Adobe Creative Suite. That's our primary setup here. It'll be Adobe Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator. So those are the three big ticket Adobe software packages. We'll spend a lot of time on each one of those um, in this course. Then we'll cover a little bit of AutoCAD. Um, AutoCAD is kind of its own uh, thing to, to cover. Uh, it really should take its own class. You should probably take two years of it um, or two semesters of it. So it's not something that I can fully cover. But what I like to focus on in that AutoCAD section is I like to give you the basics of what I think are really important to getting a high quality drawing out of AutoCAD. So how do you, how do you work with viewports and how do you make those viewports really shine uh, so that you can have good quality drawings coming out. We'll talk about line weight. We'll talk about how these drawings can really leap off the page. So that'll be in the AutoCAD section. And then we'll follow that up with a SketchUp section. A lot of you are already familiar with SketchUp, which is great. Uh, it's a pretty easy software to get yeah, a handle on. But we're going to focus not so much on how to model in SketchUp, because that comes pretty naturally. We're going to focus a lot on how do we take SketchUp and then do post-processing in the other applications that we've all already worked through during the course. So how do we take SketchUp back into Photoshop and enhance it and make that quality um, perspective image that's going to sell your design? That's really the important part of these. So it's not something where we cover Photoshop, then we move on and, and work on InDesign and we forget everything there is to forget about Photoshop and then move on to Illustrator and forget InDesign and forget Photoshop. No, this is really a building block. So we start with Photoshop, then we move into InDesign, and when we're in the InDesign section, we just kind of assume that you're, of course, going to use all the skills that you already learned in Photoshop. And then we move to Illustrator, we're going to use those skills in both Photoshop and in InDesign. And when we get to AutoCAD, we'll use skills in Illustrator, we'll use skills in Photoshop, we'll use skills in InDesign. So it's always this building block of kind of building one upon the next um, to kind of work through that, that package of softwares um, and how they can complement each other. So the thing about this software is there are some potential software costs. I've, I've eliminated the requirement for a textbook, and we'll get to that slide in a little bit, uh, for this semester because I think it's possible that you may want to work on your own computer. Uh, we do have a virtual machine set up, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides, uh, where you can log in to the school computers and use their versions, uh, their licensed versions of the software, which is great. Um, some of you would prefer to work on your own or on your own computer. That's fine. If you do, there are some potential software costs associated with using these uh, programs. So first off, Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator are part of the Adobe, what they call the Creative Cloud. Um, and that software package comes as a package. You get all three plus some extras. Uh, but you need a subscription to be able to access that. And it's $20 a month for you to have that. And I think this is the, the key caveat is that there's a minimum of a one-year subscription. So you can't just sign up for this semester and call it a day. Um, there's an early cancellation fee. So you're really committing to the year. Uh, but they do give it to you for $20 a month, which is nice. Um, it, you can see the website there if you want to click on that and, um, and go and purchase the student version uh, subscription to the Creative Cloud. So that's for Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator. Those are the first three. We move on to AutoCAD, which is done by a company called Autodesk. Um, AutoCAD is for Windows and for Mac. They have a version for both. Um, I really don't recommend the Mac version of it. I don't think it's particularly good. Uh, though I'm a, an Apple person, um, in this sense, I, I don't think it really works very well. So I would encourage you to use the Windows version uh, if you're going to use it. The nice thing about it is it's free for students. It does have little watermarks on the border, um, and that's just the, the part of the, the world of working in a student version. Um, but it is free, which is great. You guys can download it and run it on your home computer. 
Next up and last is something called SketchUp Studio. Um, they have an online version of SketchUp that works in a web browser. You could probably do some of the work in this class using that, but really you need a little bit um, more horsepower to be able to do this, and SketchUp Studio is what provides that. It is available for Windows or Mac. It's very interchangeable. If you want to work on the Mac, that's not a problem, but the student version costs $55 a year, uh, so there is definitely a software cost associated with that. Student learning outcomes for this class. Um, these are a little bit interesting because we've shifted to the online virtual learning, but it's important to kind of go through this. Really what we want to come out of this is we want you to be able to create digital presentations that incorporate images, text, graphics, and really can showcase a design idea. How do you show what that design really is about um, so that you can really make it look good uh, and sell that design? We're going to construct two and three dimensional digital representations of design elements. That's in our AutoCAD and, and um, SketchUp portion of the class. And we're going to operate and manipulate images from peripherals, scanners, printers, digital cameras, etc. Um, and that's, that's definitely part of what we're working with in this class. Like I said, I made the course handbook optional this semester, so you don't have to worry about the cost of that. I know it's a little bit unconventional, but uh, this is uh, available for you. It is a lot of the content from the website distilled down into one paperback book uh, so that you can look at the tutorials and, and make some notes in it, etc. It's there. It's optional. It's available via a print-on-demand system. Uh, Lulu is the publisher. So if you go to lulu.com slash spotlight slash DTFA, it'll take you to this um, textbook and you can of course search for coupon codes and see if you can get a discount on it etc. It should be also available in the bookstore though I don't even know honestly if the bookstore is open um, this semester so it is what it is. I have another optional textbook as well this is the layout workbook by Kristen Cullen I think this is a good um, book as well and it's really pertinent in the um, InDesign portion of the class where we spend time working through design layouts and, and what good composition means, etc. But it's not necessarily as, as directly relevant to the other portions of the class, which is why it's an optional textbook. But it will help you during that um, layout portion of the class. So it's there. If you're interested in it, you can pick it up off of Amazon, etc. So grading, this is the all-important question. Everybody wants to know, what happens with grading in this class? How do I get my grades? What am I going to be graded on, etc.? So in this world, you're going to be graded on uh, four major things. First off are your lab exercises. You're going to complete two of these every week, and I'll go into more detail on the, the upcoming slides about these. Those are worth 20% of your overall grade. Then we have your assignments. Those are worth 40% of your overall grade, and they typically require a little bit of work outside of just the lab hours. Then we have a final digital portfolio in this class. You're going to put your work together in a portfolio format. Uh, that's worth 30% of your overall grade. That is the final project. Uh, and last, we have a 10% participation. Um, so this is making comments, being an active participant in the class, not just um, sitting behind your computer and never interacting with anybody. So we want some active participation going on. There is no midterm exam. There is no final exam for this class. Uh, it's, it's as straightforward as those particular uh, elements that I just went through. I believe this course has a very even, consistent workload, and if you stay on top of it and you do the work um, in the time slots that I'm suggesting, there's no reason that you can't just kind of stay going. Uh, it's a great companion class to a studio class, so if you're taking a studio class and you want to take this class at the same time, I think that's a, a great pairing. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about the lab exercises. So these, like I said, are worth 20% of your overall grade. And really the key here is that they're designed to be completed in that 125-minute lab portion of the class. So if this were a real class, if this were set up in person, I shouldn't say real, it is of course a real class, but if it were set up as an in-person class, we would have a 125-minute, a two-hour and five-minute lab that's attached to it. And this lab portion, you'd have it twice per week, is designed for you to complete this lab exercise. And so I set up the lab exercise so that it'll take you about that amount of time to complete. It's focused on building fundamental skills. It's not focused on creating the most beautiful product that you can produce. It's really about learning the skills. Exercises, 
for this semester are going to be due at the end of the week that they are assigned. So that's a little bit different than an in-person class. In the in-person class, I would have it due at the end of the lab portion of the class. Uh, in this class, because everybody has a little bit different schedules and it's an asynchronous class, they're going to be due at the end of the week that they're assigned. So for example, this week, you're going to have two exercises. You're going to have exercise 101 and you're going to have exercise 102. Those two exercises are going to be due on Sunday. Right There's Sunday, and the date for this particular week is August 30th. And they're going to be due by midnight that day. And what do I mean when I say due? That means you need to post them to the course website. And we'll talk about that in the demo portion of this lecture a little bit later. But you're going to be submitting them through the course website, which is essentially posting them online. Uh, it'll date stamp them, and then I'll know that you've turned it in. So what I would recommend that you do is just try to keep up on a Monday and Wednesday schedule. That's when I have the open labs. When you finish with the, the project after one of those open labs, when you finish with your exercise, go ahead and post it, then you'll stay on track for the following week. So don't just wait until Sunday night. There's no reason you can't post it earlier. The other really important thing about lab exercises is that they have a pass, not pass grading system. So essentially, if you work on it and you do it and you turn it in, i.e. post it, you're going to get credit for it. You're going to get 100% on it. If you don't turn it in and you don't work on it, you're going to get a zero for it. So it's really easy. It's either you get it, credit, or you don't get credit. Uh, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So we want you to stay on top of it. We want you to actually do the work. And then you're going to get credit. The, the, the important part is that you can spend time really fully expressing yourself and not worrying about the consequences of making a mistake. Because this is really about the skill building part of this particular uh, class. So we want to build the skill and not worry about what the end result looks like. So feel free to experiment. And if it doesn't turn out exactly as you want it to, no big deal. You're still going to get credit for that lab exercise. Assignments, on the other hand, are larger and require work outside of the lab time. And so you're not going to be able to finish all of your assignment work in that two hour and five minute suggested lab time. It's going to take you a little bit more time outside of that. The key here is that it's worth 40% of your overall grade, so you want to take some time and really think about it. I think we're going to have maybe six or seven overall assignments. Uh, and if you do the math, that puts them at about, what is it, 7% of your overall grade? somewhere in that neighborhood. So each one kind of matters. And so you want to take your time and really think about it. They're going to be graded based on the skill that you used and the overall design, how the product turned out. So the exercises are about experimentation. You distill down those skills and you put it together in an assignment and you make the absolute best work you can make. And that's really what an assignment is about. So, for example, when we're working on the photography section in Photoshop, and I talk about post-processing techniques and how we might convert an image to black and white or how we might do a levels call and adjust the levels or we might adjust the curves or we might pop the image a bit. Just because those are all techniques that we've talked about doesn't mean that every one of those techniques is important for you to do on the assignment. You have to decide what are the techniques that look best on your particular assignment and do those techniques. So you really have to think about what makes it look good versus I'm just following all the, all the check boxes. That's not what it's about. The other thing that's important uh, about assignments is that I will allow you to do a regrade, one regrade on each assignment. And it's one and only one on each assignment. But what that means is you can experiment with something on, a, say, assignment 101, that photograph assignment. You try something out. You see how it works, and you, you turn it in, and you get a grade back from me. And let's say that grade wasn't so good. Let's say it was a C. And you're like, yeah, I think I can do better than that C. You're allowed to redo it. And what will happen is I will pretend that that first one never even happened. And I'll look at your second, your regrade, and grade it fresh. So it's not graded based on improvement. It's just graded as a new start, as if that first one never existed. And I think that's something that's really important because that means your grade could go up, which most of the time it does, let's be honest, but it also could go down. So if you do a worse job on it, that grade could go down. And I think that's fair if you're going to do a full regrade. So that's how it works. And you can do that on each, uh, of, those, uh, each of these assignments. You can do that regrade. One of the important things about that as well, though, is that you want to uh, turn those in as you go 
but I won't do the regrade until the very end of the semester. Uh, and that ensures that you only get one regrade on each assignment. You can't do the assignment, uh, don't like your grade, do a regrade, and then submit a regrade of the regrade, and a regrade of the regrade, and the regrade. It, no, we just do it once. And so I'll go back at the end of the semester, I'll look for any of the regrades that have been posted, and I'll do those regrades. The final portfolio. This is the end product of this class, and I think it's a great culmination of this particular uh, course because it really sums up all your work, uh, gives you a nice digital portfolio going forward, whether you're going on um, in school, whether you're going to try to get an internship or a job somewhere. It kind of sums up all your work and lets you kind of uh, summarize everything that you've done and tell the story of you. We'll talk a lot about portfolios and how they tell the story of you, the designer. Um, and we'll, we'll lecture on it, we'll explain it, etc. This semester, of course, it's going to be a digital portfolio, so you're going to be producing a PDF document for it. Uh, in previous semesters, I've, I've had people um, do an actual print portfolio, but this time, of course, we're not going to be doing that. Um, I'll give you specific instructions as the semester progresses. We've got to build some skills first before we can get into this. Um, but don't forget that it's worth 30% of your overall grade. That's a big chunk of your overall grade. And it also means that if you leave it to the last minute and do a rush job on it, and don't really spend your time and don't do, a, don't do a quality job, your grade could suffer for the overall semester. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. I've had students who have gone into that um, final having an A in the class and have dropped down because their portfolio was just not good enough and they didn't spend enough time on it. So I'm going to remind you as we get closer uh, in the semester, we'll have some days in class where you will work specifically on the portfolio and we'll talk about the portfolio. Of course I'm available during office hours to give you individual critiques on it, redline, this is working, this is not working, to really make that portfolio sing. And so that's a really important part of this class. Course participation. So this is a big one. After each exercise you complete and each assignment that you do, you'll be required to give constructive feedback to three of your classmates using the course website's comment section. So this will be something that I'll explain uh, during the demo portion of the class. But what you'll do is you'll log in, you'll look at one of, the, um, one of your fellow students' works, and you'll write a comment about why this particular design is succeeding or not succeeding. And I'm not asking for simple comments like, well, it looks cool, man, or nice job, or something like that. I want something that's constructive and really thought through about how somebody is doing well or how they might improve. So it's really meant to be a constructive criticism. And it's important not only for the students, those, those students to get that feedback, because of course I can't, uh, I think I have over 100 students this semester, I can't get every single one of you uh, individualized feedback on everything that you turn in. But it's important for you to get that feedback as a student from your fellow students, but it's also important for you to learn how to articulate what it is that makes a design good or what, a, what it is that's off about a design and to be able to write that out. So there is a character limit uh, or a character minimum, I should say. It's not a character limit. On the comments, it needs to be at least 25 characters. That means you can't just say, huh, oh, cool or nice job or something like that. You need to actually try to articulate something. Um, there's also a feature in there that won't let you comment too quickly. So if you're writing comments too fast, it'll stop you and slow you down. That's so that you actually concentrate and do three good quality comments. So what I would encourage you to do is before each lab session or while you're getting started with each lab session, it's a perfect time to do it, uh, when you first log in, go ahead and write those three comments for the previous day. So for example, Let's say it's Wednesday of this week. You'll come into the lab session and say, okay, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write three comments on the post that everybody made for exercise 101. If you do that, you're going to stay on top of the comments. And in any one day, you're not going to have to write more than three to maybe six comments. Maybe it was an assignment and an exercise posted. So just keep, keep getting in the habit of that. Uh, I think over the course of the semester, the total number of comments is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80 comments. Um, so you've got a lot of comments to write, but again, constructive, good quality comments is what we're looking for. So computers are really important this semester. It's no surprise, we're in a remote setup here, and in that virtual setup, you're going to be working on your own computer. 
if you don't have access to your own computer, there are some loaner computers available through DVC. Um, you, can, you can email me if you need those specific requirements or, or if you need to, to set something up. But we have some basic computer requirements for this class. These aren't too extreme, but I think they're a good rule of thumb. I personally don't have a problem if you use a Windows computer or you use a Mac computer. I'm a Mac person myself, though sometimes I have to run Windows in parallel so that I can run some of the software uh, that, that I use on an everyday basis or that we'll talk about in this particular class. If you plan to run that software natively rather than through the provided remote desktop uh, or virtual machine, which we'll talk about in depth later on in the class, uh, then you need to be aware that there are some better software packages that are available on Windows that might not be as good on a Mac. I mentioned that earlier with AutoCAD. Um, AutoCAD for the Mac really is not that good in my opinion. Uh, I think the Windows version is significantly better. So in that scenario you might run in Parallels or Boot Camp on your Mac. Um, so it might be a little bit of a sacrifice but uh, that might be beneficial. The other thing that you're going to need is you're going to need 20 to 50 gigabytes of free space on your computer. Now I think this is one of the challenges with computers today is, is when we move to the solid state hard drive we lost hard drive space uh, on our computers. And when we lose hard drive space, computers get slow, uh, or you might not have enough room to store all those files that you're working on. So if you don't have 20 to 50 gigs free of space, uh, then you might consider an external hard drive. Um, they're, they're cheap, they're easy. Get yourself an external hard drive, it gives you plenty of storage space. Uh, I run with a couple external hard drives uh, plugged into my computer. So uh, that just gives you a little bit of extra space and I would encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, I would say the minimum for RAM on your computer is 8 gigs. Uh, I would feel significantly better if you had 16 gigs of RAM. I think it works a lot better. If you're going to be using any of the programs natively on your computer, that's where the 16 gigs really comes in. If you're going to be using the remote desktop scenario, uh, you can probably get by with 8. The other thing that is no surprise is you need a stable, strong internet connection. Um, most of the at-home internet, if you have Comcast, you have AT&T, those are usually substantial enough and, and good enough to provide good high quality internet connections to the campus so that you can use the computer and remote desktop and of course simultaneously be on a Zoom during the hours. If you're going to try to tether to your cell phone or, or use a hotspot or something, eh, those, are, those are a little bit wishy-washy on their ability to, to connect to everything at once and stay free of lags and, and that sort of thing. So I would, I would say that's not really recommended for this class. I think a good strong internet connection is significantly better. Continuing on, a couple things about the remote desktop virtual machine setup. Uh, no work can be stored on those remote desktops. In fact, when you log in, you get a different computer each time, so you, you can't plan on your work being there. Uh, that being said, a USB drive or an external hard drive, which I mentioned earlier as being a good idea, um, would be something I'd invest in because if you use the remote desktop client, which I'll again have a tutorial on explaining um, a little bit later on, um, you can actually connect that directly into the virtual machine, which is nice, uh, and that'll let you store your files locally. Uh, Microsoft OneDrive can also be used to sync files to that remote desktop or virtual machine should you want to do that as well. Please, please, please be careful to safeguard your files and don't lose them. Don't let your flash drive or hard drive go through the wash. All of those things are not, not a good thing. So one, you lose your work. Two, it's your problem. You have to make sure you take care of those. And we'll spend a whole lecture. Next lecture, 102, is all about backing up your files. So we'll talk about that in more depth. Um, a digital camera or a phone. It used to be that a uh, digital uh, phone camera was not sufficient. Now, in this day and age, the phone cameras are often better than a digital camera. So uh, if you have a good phone, that's fine. You're going to need to be able to take some pictures in this class. And I encourage you to take your own pictures. And by taking your own pictures, you can really um, learn a lot more about post-processing rather than just finding sample images online. A lot of times those are taken by professional photographers that have already been post-processed. So we want to take some nice raw images that you've taken and then learn how to post-process those images. So a digital camera is also important. If you don't have one, email me and we'll, we'll see what we can do about making an arrangement for you to borrow one, etc. So we've got some Zoom guidelines. Um, and so the first time that you log in to Zoom, um, we're going to need to take care of a few things uh, for the labs. Number one, the open labs and office hours are obviously going to be held using the Zoom platform. That's how we're going to communicate. That's how we're going to uh, work through this virtual online setting. Students need to download and install Zoom 
prior to the start of class, no surprise. Um, you're gonna need this Zoom to be able to access. I'm gonna send out the uh, Zoom IDs, the login IDs and the passwords so you'll know uh, where to log in, etc. cetera. Um, you, I would really encourage you to turn on your cameras during Zoom. I know that some people don't wanna be seen or they had a bad night and don't wanna share their room or, or what have you that they're sitting in. Um, I understand. So it's not a requirement that you do, but it really helps build a community when you can see each other as opposed to just looking at a name on a black background. So if you can, turn on the camera. I think that's a good idea. You are gonna to have to give some permissions if you want me to control your screen remotely and help walk you through certain settings. So I'll probably ask you to do that and, and set that up. Uh, but that's something we'll do on an as needed basis. Um, students, please keep your microphone muted when you first log in, unless you're actively speaking. Uh, there's nothing more distracting than having, you know, the dog barking in the background or the kids running in. Of course, sometime during the semester, I'm sure my kids will come running in uh, and interrupt things. But it is one of those things that happens. So um, try to keep it muted unless you're actively talking to me and, and speaking. If you need assistance, send me a chat message saying, hey, I need, to, I need some help. And then I'll, of course, be glad to help you. Also, if I'm already helping somebody, don't just, you know, interject and say, hey, I need you next. Go ahead and send me a chat message and I'll put you into a queue of people that I'll help to the next, to the next, to the next. The other thing is, from a legal standpoint, I need you to change your Zoom ID to be your just your first name. I can't have your last name in there. It's, a, it's an educational privacy thing. So um, play, change your Zoom name to just be your first name. That's it. Uh, and that'll be really helpful. The other thing I want to tell you all is that the Zoom sessions may be recorded in this class uh, and they may be posted to YouTube depending on whether I find that helpful for other students uh, going forward. So you, you may be subject to that as well. So some general guidelines about the class. As I said, this is an asynchronous online class. Attendance during the labs is not required, but it's highly recommended. So as long as you're doing the work, that's okay. But I promise you when we get into some of the more difficult things, let's say it's clipping masks in Illustrator, um, those are the kinds of things that you're gonna wanna be able to log in and talk to me about because they're gonna, you're gonna struggle with it. Um, so take your time, come to those open lab hours and ask me the questions. That's what I'm here for. I wanna be able to make you uh, good at these particular pieces of software. Time management is absolutely going to be critical, let's be honest. You have to be your own policing agent. We don't have set class hours. We don't have set lab hours, etc. So it's not so much you have to be sitting down at the computer for that extent of time, but you have to put the time in. So this class per week, if I add up lecture and lab hours, should be about six hours and 10 minutes. That's a significant chunk of time. And you need to invest that time to be successful in this class. So make sure you block aside the time, and I would recommend doing it on Mondays and Wednesdays, um, for this class and to be able to do the work. That's what it's going to take. If you get too far behind, you're not going to be able to catch up. And that's another really important thing. If you've missed more than three assignments, or you haven't completed those assignments in a semester, you may be dropped. You also might receive an F in the class. So generally, when we get to that 75% mark where you're allowed to withdraw uh, and take the class over, I try to send out emails to people that are behind or missing assignments and make sure that, that they can actually uh, try to catch up or have a plan, or maybe they want out at that point. But remember, this is a college class, and you're responsible for yourself. If you don't feel like you're doing well and you feel like you need to get out of the class and you want to withdraw, withdraw yourself. Don't rely on somebody else like me to kick you out of class. I would rather have you stay in. I want you to complete the work. I want you to succeed. So I'm really hesitant to just drop you. So please be here, do the work, succeed, and do great work. Assignment due dates are going to be announced in class and they'll appear on the course calendar. I think one of the important things about this is that the assignments are due on midnight on the day that they're due, not necessarily Sunday of that particular week. So we may have an assignment due on a Wednesday, for example, by midnight, or a Monday by midnight. That's different than the Sunday night exercise plan that we'll be on. So be aware, look, look at the calendar, know when those due dates are. I'll, of course, remind you of when those due dates are, but be aware that they can be different than the Sunday due dates. Exercises, like I said, are gonna be due on Sunday at midnight. They're gonna be due every week on Sunday at midnight, 
you need to do both of the exercises for that week. So for example, this week, we're gonna have exercise 101 and exercise 102. Those are both due uh, Sunday at midnight. Late work is gonna be marked down using the late work policy, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later slide. So here we are with the late work policy. Late assignments and exercises are graded down by 10%, so one full letter grade. If you've got an A on a particular assignment and it's late by four calendar days, up to four calendar days, it will be marked down to a B. So it's one full letter grade or 10%. If you had a 95, it becomes an 85. If you had an 85, it becomes an, a 75. You get the idea. Assignments not turned in after 16 calendar days late will receive a maximum of 50% overall. So, for each four days that it's late, you drop 10%, and then if it's beyond those first four days, or the, the, the first 16 days, which would be four drops, the maximum percentage you can get is 50%. But I'll tell you right now, it's a lot better to get that 50% than to get a zero. So every little bit helps. Assignments not hinted in all will receive a zero. Not that that's a, that's a big surprise. So it's really important to think about something here. So late work is really not a good thing. You get docked by a lot, a big percentage every time. And I do this on purpose because in the world of architecture, let's say you're practicing architect and you have a meeting scheduled with a design review commission or a planning commission. There's a hard deadline for when you have to submit your drawings. Let's say it's Monday at 4 p.m. If you don't make that Monday at 4 p.m. deadline, you don't get on the calendar, you don't get to have your meeting. They'll put somebody else in, in front of you and you'll have to wait until the following meeting. Maybe that's a month away. And that's not good for your client. So you really can't afford in practice to be late. So the same thing applies here. Don't be late. Turn something in. The other thing that I'll, this is like, shh, don't tell anybody. It's better to turn something in that you're not happy with and do a regrade on it than to be late. The late work sticks even through a regrade. So if you're late by, by eight days and you've dropped 20%, even if you do a regrade and you do the best possible work, the best percentage you could get would be an 80%. Because that late work policy always applies. Some additional general guidelines. While I will be available for one-on-one -on -one or small group discussion via Zoom during those, lab, those open lab times and my office hours, if you get stuck on something, try to look things up. Look on the course website, look at the previous lectures, look at the tutorials, and see if you can't get yourself unstuck. Don't wait for me, try to get yourself unstuck. Ask your friends, ask somebody else in the Zoom. We could do a breakout room if you want so that you could talk to somebody else and get that feedback. That's really important. I strongly suggest you take notes as I talk. Um, ideally, if you have the handbook, you take notes in the handbook. If not, just, just in a notebook would be fine. Uh, sometimes that really helps. I do try to record every one of my lectures. This semester, of course, everything will be recorded. Um, so you will, you will get to be able to watch it on YouTube, go back, rewind, pause, work on something, come back, bring it up, play some more, etc. And a lot of times that will really help you get through. I have a YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash digital tools for arch. Um, that's where all my videos are posted. You can see previous semester's videos posted there as well, but of course this semester's videos will be posted there uh, for you to watch. Your class, Archie 135, are all the 100s series. So you'll see that your lectures are 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, etc. Your lab exercises are 101, 102, 103, etc. And all, um, and basically anything that has to do with this class starts in the 100s. My second class, the 136, which is my Rhino and V-Rite class, everything is in the 200s. So 201, 202, 203, et cetera. So because of that, um, you can kind of keep separate. So when you're looking at YouTube and you see a lecture in the 200s, you can ignore it. Look for the lectures in the 100s. This is an online virtual class. You need, you need to view the lectures prior to the start of the labs each week, ideally. And those lectures range from 40 minutes to 90 minutes on any individual lecture. So you need to commit the time to actually sit down and watch these particular lectures because that's how you're gonna learn the content that I need you to learn. All the content in this class is done under a Creative Commons license. Um, it's the share alike non-commercial attribution Creative Commons license. If you need more information, uh, you can do a Google search and, and learn about it. Essentially, that means that what we're doing, we're all sharing. 
um, and nobody has any uh, rights to be able to infringe or uh, to demand copyright and, and that sort of thing. So we're all doing things together. If you have questions, send me an email and we can talk about that. So let's look at some student work from previous semesters before we get into some of the live demos for today. Uh, the student work from previous semesters, just to get you some, some idea of the kinds of work that we, we do. Uh, I'll flip through these rather quickly. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the photography section of the class working through Photoshop and post-processing techniques and how to enhance images, uh, add drama to images, uh, and that sort of thing. We talk a lot about composition and what makes a strong composition and what draws you into a particular photograph. Then we move into advanced photo editing. This is where we're going to use Photoshop to combine things that don't belong together, which is ultimately about collage and collaging in design and making your designs feel like there's something that's real that actually belong, beyond, uh, belong together. Uh, a good example here being almost creepy in how well they uh, are combined together. So sometimes results end up being a little bit more artistic, sometimes a little bit more painterly, sometimes just kind of bizarre. But at the same time, this is what Photoshop is about. It's about bending reality. Um, and sometimes showing, showcasing your designs by bending reality. Then we move into layout and graphic design. We're going to do a lecture series poster. And this is really about typography. It's about layout and composition. It's about consistency. And we'll work through a bunch of examples. Then we'll get into AutoCAD and computer-aided drafting. And this is really a learning about how do you present information, how do you get good line weights, how do you do some collage work such that you can see things in a presentation format really nicely. Then we'll do some 3D modeling and some collage work. And so these 3D models have backgrounds associated with them. They have textures. They're designed to bring the drawing to the forefront and make it feel more realistic, make it feel part of the reality, such that it belongs in the scene. And so we'll work through those kind of collage elements. So I end this, this introduction, with the question of what will you create? And I think this is something that's really important going forward. It's really about what makes, what makes it exciting for me to be here and teach it? You're a different person, and you're going to bring something different to the table. I've taught this for 13 years, and every time somebody surprises me with something new, a creative way of looking at something that's different, that's what I always look forward to each semester. So you guys are going to bring different things to the table, and you're going to show me something new, and you're going to make this exciting. So what will you create? So we're going to move on now into more of a demonstration portion. I'm going to talk about the website and how do you register and how do you log in and how do you make your first post, etc. So stay tuned. We've moved on into the demonstration portion of today's lecture and for today we're going to go through what you're going to be doing in exercise 101 which is kind of our introductory exercise for the course. Uh, and so today I'm going to concentrate on the website, making sure you get registered, uh, and kind of walk you through the website and, and, and that sort of thing so that we are ready to go uh, to hit the ground running, so to speak, as we go forward in the class. So what I have pulled up is I have the website uh, pulled up on Chrome on my computer here. Uh, the website is digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, and that brings you to this site right here. Uh, and so this is the, the website that we're going to be using in lieu of Canvas this semester. And so I want to point out some of the features. So first off, under the About tab here, this is where you'll find things like the course syllabus, for example, the course calendar, the calendar feed, so you can subscribe to the calendar, uh, and those sorts of things. They're available uh, under the Digital Tools for Designers or Archie 135 section. Um, and so there's additional information should you be interested in, information, for example, about letters of recommendation, etc. The next tab over is the lectures section. This is where all the lectures will be posted um, for the class. So if we come down to the Digital Tools for Designers tab and come over here um, to, sorry, this hasn't been refreshed. Let me refresh it. There we go. And if we come down here 
uh, to the Digital Tools for Designers tab, and there it is, Fall of 2020. If you click on that, this will show us the lectures in chronological order. This Thus far, only Lecture 101 has been posted, but 102, 103 will continue to be posted from here. Uh, if you click on Lecture 101, like this, um, Without me being logged in, we'll get to log in in just a second, uh, we get this error saying there's, there's content that's restricted on this page, but this is where we'll have information about the lecture, um, and so we'll go ahead and do the login, and then you can see that information. So, you should have all received yesterday uh, login credentials via your email. If you didn't receive it, go ahead and check your spam folder, but it's going to ask you, if I click on that login button on the far right side here, it's going to ask you for your username or email address. I set up your email addresses to all be the uh, one that you have listed in your Insight email. So you, for most of you, it's your school email, but some of you have changed it to be a different email address. That's the email address I used. So you're going to go ahead and type that in, uh, in this field. Uh, in my case, I have a sample student account that I'm going to use. Um, so it's is my sample student account. Uh, and then you're going to go ahead and type in your password. Now, in the case of your student account, your new student account, uh, this will be something that the email will send you. It'll be a random string of numbers for security purposes, and you go ahead and paste that into this field. Uh, in my case, I have to actually type in uh, password, and then I'll go ahead and click on login. Again, if you didn't get this information via the automated email, you could also click on the lost your password link and that would do a password reset for you, uh, which would send it to you as well. I have had in the past some trouble with the Gmail uh, accounts that it sends to. Sometimes it goes in the spam folder, so go ahead and check your spam folder there as well. So this is the back end of the website. Uh, this gives us kind of a little bit of information at a glance here. A uh, couple things to point out. Uh, the first thing is on the left side here in black, we have what are called posts. This is how you're going to be turning in your work. We'll actually create one a little bit later. Uh, you can view all of your posts if you want. Uh, we have a comment section. We'll get to that a little bit later as well. But for right now, come all the way down to the Profile tab here. So if you click on that Profile tab, it'll take you to the Profile section. Uh, and this is where we have the ability to, starting uh, right here, we can customize our profile image. This personalizes things a little bit, gives people a sense of what you look like when you uh, are logged in. Um, so you can click on it and upload your own photo uh, to change that picture. We can come down here a little bit further. Uh, your username has already been set, but you can fill out this other information. Now, my account's pre-existing, so I already have other information. We have a first name, last name, uh, your nickname, and how you want to display your name. So I could choose to just be called Grant uh, or Grant Adams, uh, etc. Then we have our email. Uh, if you want to change your email, you can, uh, you can do that, and it'll send you a new email address to confirm it. This is if you don't want to use your school email uh, you can do that as well. That happens to be my work email, by the way. Uh, so we'll continue down here. We'll talk about some of these other accounts. You don't have to fill anything in here unless you want to. Uh, likewise, you don't have to fill in any biographical information. Uh, and we can keep coming down here. And this is where if you want to change your password, right, you can click here on that new password and this will generate a password for you. Now that's a random string of numbers. If you don't want to use the random string of numbers, though there is logic to that, and we'll talk about that in lecture 102 for this class, but if you don't want to use that random string of numbers, you can actually select it and type in, you know, my dog's name, etc. Now, the problem here is that's medium. If it's really bad, you know, my dog, for example, uh, you have to actually confirm the use of the weak password. They really want you to have a strong, secure password, and I'd prefer that you did that as well. Anyway, um, once you've done that, you can click on update profile. Of course, I'm not going to do that and unlock my account for you guys, but that would be how you would change your, uh, your password. I'm going to go back to the main site, and I'll do that up here in the black ribbon across the top. I'll click right over here. The drop-down says visit site. We can leave those changes right now. And this brings us back to um, the actual course website, the front end of the course website. The black bar right here at the top is indicating that I've actually logged in, which is a good thing. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come here and I'm going to continue going through. I told you before that we went to lectures and then fall of 2020, and then we clicked on lecture 101. Now that I'm logged in, all of the information will actually populate. 
So here's the recording of Lecture 101. Here are previous semester's videos, should you want to go back in time and watch a different lecture. Then we can come down here to the, the lecture downloads. These will be the slides for each lecture. I actually haven't updated with the current slides. I'll put that in there. Uh, actually, it'll probably be there by the time you guys watch this video. Um, and you'll be able to download the PDF of those um, should you want the actual slides. Uh, and then I have a link to the course syllabus, which is, of course, what this course, is, the, the first lecture is about, just the introduction. When we move over into the next tab here, we have our tutorial section. And this is where we can actually find information about individual software. So, for example, we're going to be starting in Photoshop next week. And from here, we can go over to, say, Photoshop 1.2. Well, I'll do 1.1 1 .1 because it's the first one here. This is black and white. And this is a tutorial that's written up about how to turn an image into black and white in Photoshop. So we have that this is black and white. Here's a video of that um, process. And then we can come down here, and here's a step-by-step -step with little images uh, that kind of help you through the process and what you're looking for, etc. So those are all there for you, uh, for your benefit long term. And of course, you can see that there's lots and lots of these uh, as we go forward. Next tab over is the Exercises tab. And in the Exercises tab, we can actually see the exercise that you'll be doing uh, for each class day or for each uh, week uh, as we go through. So we can click on Fall of 2020. And again, these will update. You'll probably see exercise 102 pretty soon. But for right now, we have just exercise 101. This is what you're going to be doing today. I'm going to go ahead and right click this and open it in a new tab. And I'll leave it up here because we'll come back to it as our first exercise today. We move over, move over into the assignments tab. There aren't currently any assignments. So this is just last semester's assignments. Um, that'll be posted and updated once you get your first assignment. The resources tab contains useful information uh, for a variety of, of, of uh, the classes. There's downloadable resource packages. These are things that you can download and use later on, including brushes and textures and that sort of thing. Uh, so they're all there for your, your enjoyment down the road. The next tab over is the student work tab. This is where you can see what other work your fellow students are doing. It's also the easiest way to, uh, to write some comments about other people's work. So if you go to student work, for example, and you go to digital tools for designers here, we can come over to exercise and choose exercise 101. That's the exercise that you're working on uh, in your first lab session. So here it is, student work exercise 101. And here are all the posts that students have made in reverse chronological order for exercise 101. You can see that as we keep going down, and down, 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 there's lots more. So it's going to show us the top 40 or so for right now, and you'll see this will continue to populate as you go forward. You can do the same thing with assignments. So you can go to assignments, you can see assignment 101, and these are all the assignments that people have done um, for assignment 101. And the last tab over here is login. So let's jump over to the tab for exercise 101. This is our exercise um, that you'll be working on first. So here's 101. This is your registration and first post. Um, there's your introduction. First part is about that login and changing your password. Um, so all of that we've already gone through. So we'll move on to part two. And part two is really about making that first post. And this is something that you're going to uh, work on today during the lab period. And remember, these are open lab periods, so it could be uh, between 9 and 11 today, or you could log in during the 12 uh, noon to 2 section. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to make your first post. Now, I'm not under the delusion that this would actually take you the full 125 minutes to complete. Um, so my guess is that this will be a little bit of a freebie for you. You'll breeze through it. But we're going to make a post. And what I want you to do is I want you to find a website that has some relevance to the design fields. Now, some of you are inter interested in architecture. So finding something related to architecture would be good. If you're interested in landscape architecture, find an article related to landscape architecture. If you're interested in uh, product design or industrial design, find something that's interesting to you in industrial design. So I'm going to go ahead and jump over into a new tab and I'll go to Arc Daily because that has a good set of information for, uh, for architects. They're interesting little um, buildings. And so I'll pick something that looks interesting to me and we'll, we'll expand it here and we'll look at this particular site. Alternatively, you could also search for something specific, like I could, for example, type in Pantheon. And there it is. 
There's the Roman Pantheon. Uh, and so I could write a little summary about Roman Pantheon, and I could link to this particular article. It's got some good information, got some floor plans, um, and we can see some really nice pictures of what it looks like inside, etc. So I'm going to use this as my example. And what Exercise 101 is asking me to do is to actually create a post that has a link to that website and gives a little bit of a summary about that website. This is not a writing class, so I'm not expecting a really long-winded dissertation on the Pantheon uh, or any other site that you might choose, but a little bit of information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new tab or a new post. And I'll do that by coming up here to the new, the, there's at the black bar at the top of the page, there's a little new button. And I'm going to come down to post. So I've gone to new and then post. And when I click that, it will open up the add new post dialog box. And this is essentially how you're going to be turning in your work each day of class uh, or each exercise that you complete. So I'm going to start with a title. So this is exercise 101. And let's add my name behind it. And then in this field, this is very much like a um, what you see is what you get editor. It's like opening up Word. So what I type in here is what the post will contain. So I might say this is the Roman Pantheon. And uh, I might have some, some brief information about it. So maybe I'll write a quick summary. Uh, you know, the Pantheon was built in AD uh, 130, 113, sorry. Um, and was the largest spanning dome until 19, oh, let's see, I think it's 1949. Anyway, my, my history might be a little bit off, uh, so is my spelling. There it is, and I might continue with a little bit more information about it. Uh, and then I might say here is Here's an interesting link to the Pantheon. Again, it would help if I could spell correctly. Uh, from Mark Daly. And then I could take my, uh, let's go back to the main page here. I can take the link right here, select it, copy it. I could also right click and say copy. Jump back over into my posts and then I could right click and say paste. Now there's the link. I could add a little bullet point so that there's the link. And I want to make this a clickable link, so I'll select it and then click the Insert Link button. And that converts it to a link, just like that. So now that I have this text written out with the little link here, there's a couple things that I need to do. One, you'll notice at the very top that this entry has no featured image. image. Please set one you need to set a featured image before publishing. And that's why I, the publish button here is grayed out and I can't click on that. So we need to set a featured image. So first off, we need to find a featured image. So I'm gonna go ahead and open a new tab and I'm going to uh, use a Creative Commons search. So I'll do search.creativecommons.org, uh, there we go. And this just means, uh, this is a way of searching for images that I'm allowed to use. Um, so let me type Pantheon. And there we go. And I could pick an image that I like. There it is. It's a nice image. And I could actually download this image. Uh, let's go to the images website here. There we go. And we could download that image. I'm going to download the original and it's going to go to my downloads folder and we'll jump back over into the post and in my new post window I'm going to scroll all the way to the very bottom and at the very bottom right side there is a featured image box. I'm going to click on the set featured image link and then I'll go ahead and upload. So I've clicked on the tab for upload files. I'll select the file. Alternatively, I could drag the file in. So let me go to my downloads. And there it is. And it will upload that image for me. Once it finishes processing, I'll see a little preview of the image. There it is. And I'll go ahead and click on the set featured image in the lower right corner 
right here. Now that featured image is set, I'll scroll back up and you'll see that as soon as I do that, that warning across the top goes away and the publish button becomes active. So I can actually turn in my um, post at this point. Let me scroll down a little bit more and here under categories, this is going to help me stay organized. So I'm going to look in the category section and I'm going to scroll down here. We want to get into digital tools for designers. It's not an assignment, it's an exercise. So I'm going to be here in exercises and it is exercise 101. So I make sure that one's, that one's really the only one that's critical is checking the box for exercise 101. Once I have that done, I can click on the publish link right here. And the publish link is effectively like turning in your work. It's showing me that yes, uh, I've turned it in and it's now part of the course website. At the very top here, I can click on view post and we'll see there's that post that I just made. There's my, my text that I wrote. There's my link to it. Perfect. Now, if we go back to the home page, let me go back to the home page itself, you'll see right here that there is my post. It's the most recent post that's showing up under the student work section. And if I went to student work and then I went to my uh, digital tools for designers and I went to exercises 101, Lo and behold, there is that post that I created. That's how I would find it. Now, I mentioned also that you guys are going to be responsible this semester for writing comments to each post. You need to do three for every exercise. So in, in exercise 101, you'll need to write three comments. And actually, the best time to do it would be the next day that you log in. So if you did this on Monday, then on Wednesday when you come back in, you'd write your comments. So to do the comments, you'd go ahead and click on uh, somebody's post. In this case, I only have my own, uh, unfortunately, but I'll pick on somebody else's uh, from last semester here. Uh, let me go ahead and click on that. And I'd look at this student's post and I'd say, you know what, that green wall is pretty interesting. And so I'd analyze it. Maybe I'd even go as far as reading what the uh, student wrote about it. Maybe I'd visit the actual uh, website. And as long as I'm logged in, I can come down here under the comment section and I can actually type a comment. And you see how it says logged in as Grant Adams. It's very important that you're logged in because that's how I'm going to be able to tell that you actually did the comments. That's how I'll count them. So you need to make sure you're logged in. And then we need to go ahead and write some kind of a nice comment about this. Remember, it's not going to be like, wow, cool. That's not a good comment. We need to write something constructive. So you might say on this building, uh, I really like how the concrete facade um, juxtaposes against the green wall. Uh, it highlights uh, this featured green patch. Uh, it highlights this featured green patch nicely uh, and breaks uh, monotony. All right, so I said I really like how the concrete facade juxtaposes against the green wall. Uh, and I really should be clear, this should be the green wall highlights this featured green patch nicely and breaks apart the building monotony. When I'm done here, I go ahead and click on post comment. And once I've posted the comment, there it is. And it shows up here as a comment and tells me what time I commented, etc. Now for you guys, the first time that you log in and create a comment, it's probably not going to show up. This is a spam filter because I have to manually approve you for commenting. So don't panic if it doesn't show up right away. I will go through and I will approve your comments. And then once they're approved from then on, it will show up like mine did right away. So a couple other things to keep in mind here. Uh, if we want to see all of my posts, I can go back to the dashboard. And when I've clicked on the dashboard here, I can come down all the way down into my posts and I can say, show me all of my posts. And so for you, you'll only have the first post, which is exercise 101. But for me, you can see that I've made other sample posts back in time and all of my posts show up there in reverse chronological order. 
Okay, so that's the website in a nutshell. I know it might be a little daunting at first. I promise you, everybody's always been able to pick up on it and, and um, do it rel relatively easily after a few tries. If you're struggling with this, this is a perfect opportunity to log into the open lab hours and I can help you one-on-one -on -one and we can get you through that first post and make sure you're good to go going forward. So that's the end of today's lecture, which is lecture 101, course introduction, registration, and first post. I'll be posting lecture 102 soon as well. Thank you very much and have a good week.